Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to explore the nature of poltergeist phenomena. With me is Dr. Stephen Browdy, who is the author of the Limits of Influence, a book about psychokinesis, and many other books, including The Gold Leaf Lady, Immortal Remains, and Crimes of Reason. Dr. Browdy is a past president of the Parapsychological Association and past chairman of the Philosophy Department at the University of Maryland in Baltimore County. Welcome again, Steve. Thank you, Jeff. Good to be here. Let's begin by defining the term poltergeist. Probably the best way to do that, well, literally it means noisy spirit or mm -hmm. noisy ghost. It's a but, German word. Yes. Um, it's probably best to distinguish poltergeist cases from haunting cases. Okay. Now, we're still going to use the term somewhat loosely. They're always borderline cases, and that can't be helped, but I think it's fair to generalize. Um, Haunting cases tend to be recurrent psychokinetic events that are related to a place. They mm -hmm. center around a place. They're place-centered phenomena. Poltergeist cases center rather around a person, a so-called poltergeist agent. One reason we know that is because in the clearest cases at any rate, when the person changes location, the phenomena follow. Mm -hmm. and the received view of what goes on in a poltergeist case is that the agent, typically a teenager or an adolescent, is someone who has some serious emotional difficulties, no conventional or easy way to deal with those very powerful emotions. And it's as if the agent can't get them out in any kind of constructive, ordinary way. And so the phenomena are like a kind of brute psychic flailing about. It's as if the person has all these intense feelings and then just goes woof and then things happen. Objects fly around or they shatter or burst into flame and fall off shelves and so on. And cases of this sort have been reported <coughs> in uh, various literatures for centuries. At least as far back as the 16th century, yes. Mm -hmm. And cases of hauntings have also go back a long time. Yes. What's interesting about the poltergeist literature is that even though it goes back so far, um, the cases bear remarkable similarities to one another. And that's significant because the people who were reporting these unusual phenomena hundreds of years ago, there was no common body of literature mm -hmm. which they had access to. There was no received view of poltergeists at that time. Uh, in fact, these were quite independent accounts of very similar phenomena. Often in different countries. Yes. And the phenomena agree, and this is what's most interesting, in very, very peculiar details. So from these independent accounts, we see reports of the raining of stones inside a house. Uh, even more strangely, the raining of excrement inside mm -hmm. a house. The slow and gentle trajectory of um, floating objects. Um, the fact that the objects that move from one location to another are very warm to the touch and sometimes too hot to handle. Mm -hmm. Of course, once again, in, in any instance of macro psychokinesis, uh, skeptics are, are inclined to insist that this must all be fraud or, or ca careless observation. Yes, yeah, so they often suggest it has to be um, motivated misperception or uh, that people are seeing what they want to see or that they have a bias in favor of the miraculous or a bias in favor of these particular kinds of phenomena. I think it's a very lame argument. It's hard to imagine what sort of uh, bias people could have antecedently for raining of stones or excrement inside a house. And also, uh, these are people uh, who typically had no prior interest in the paranormal. And it's not clear why they would want these phenomena to be happening to them anyway, because at least these days, mm -hmm. when someone claims to be the victim of a poltergeist attack, uh, they're usually subject to lots of media attention, uh, gawkers, uh, intense criticism, and so on. And it's a kind of attention that very few people actually, I think, want. Yeah, accusations of fraud. Right. 
Um, now, we have to say that there have been some fraudulent cases. Sometimes, even in the best cases, there have been times when the poltergeist agents have helped the phenomena mm -hmm. along. But what makes the best cases the best cases is that the strongest and most interesting phenomena can't be explained in that way. Well, the very term poltergeist suggests, uh, noisy ghost, suggests that the agent of the phenomenon is not a human being, but some sort of a discarnate being. That's what many people thought initially before mm -hmm. the connection between what was going on inside the agent yeah. um, was, was recognized. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. This is a great case from the 1920s, and it's also a case of a malevolent poltergeist. It's the case of Eleanor Zugun, a Romanian peasant girl who one day was walking to her grandmother's house, and she found some money on the side of the road. And when she arrived at her destination, she bought some sweets with the money and consumed all the sweets. And when her 105-year-old grandmother, reputed to be a witch, found out about this, she told Eleanor that uh, the money was the devil's money. And since she had eaten sweets purchased with the devil's money, the devil was now inside her and would never leave her. Mm. And the next day, phenomena began. Mm. Uh, objects were flinging themselves against the house, um, sometimes at Eleonora. And then soon thereafter, Eleonora started to break out and bite and scratch marks all over her hands and arms and face. And what made it even more peculiar, and some of this was watched very close at hand, so they could see that mm -hmm. Eleonora wasn't doing this to herself. The bite marks sometimes even had um, spittle accompanying it and bacterial bacteriological analysis was done of it, and it, it was found that the bacteriological content was different from that of Eleanor's own saliva. Okay. Well, that would suggest there might well have been some sort of an external entity. Well, that's certainly how Eleanor thought about it. She yeah. thought Draku, the devil, was inside her. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that once she started to get her period, the phenomena disappeared, yeah. and then Eleanor just settled down to the peaceful life of a hairdresser mm -hmm. in Bucharest. Well, typically, uh, poltergeist cases are of limited duration. Yes. Uh, some have gone on for uh, quite a while. Um, there's a really good Australian case, the Mayanup case, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, that began in the 1950s but went on for several decades thereafter. Several decades. Yes. Uh -huh. And once again, centered on a particular person. Yeah, it's not always easy in these uh, the two best Australian cases to know um, whether there's just one agent or a collection of agents. Mm -hmm. They're very interesting dynamically. Mm -hmm. But what you're suggesting from your studies of the poltergeist, and I know you have a big interest in the survival literature as well, is yes. that one need not conclude that uh, poltergeist phenomena are produced by a discarnate entity. No, there's really no evidence of that. The evidence more strongly, at least to me, suggests mm -hmm. that uh, the living are responsible for the phenomena. Yeah. Because typically when the agent's emotional problems are resolved, as in the case of Eleanor apparently, mm -hmm. uh, the phenomena go away. Mm -hmm. So it makes more sense psychodynamically than uh, a survivalist conjecture in that case. And there's no real evidence from the poltergeist cases that somebody has survived bodily death and dissolution. Mm -hmm. So as survival cases are extremely weak, as cases of macro PK among the living, they're very strong. Okay. Well, one of the cases uh, that has been in the media a lot uh, in the last uh, decades is, is the Enfield poltergeist in right. England. It, it went on for several years and uh, was studied by colleagues of ours from the Society for Psychical Research yes. in London, yes. where uh, uh, they, uh, at, at the end of their analysis, were still, I, I would say, mystified as to whether the phenomenon were produced by two young uh, teenage girls who, who lived in the house where most of the phenomenon occurred, or not, because many phenomenon uh, occurred w when those two girls weren't around at all. Right. That case is actually a difficult one to figure out because there were voices that were manifesting as well. It's yeah. not just objects flying around or in one of the cases, one of the girls flying around yes. apparently. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, the Enfield case is a little bit different from some of the more classic poltergeist cases. Mm -hmm. In the other cases, what distinguishes them is the peculiar movement of objects, for example. So in many cases, um, the quantity of stones or yeah. 
rocks raining inside a house is much more than any one person could have surreptitiously uh, thrown or managed to. And when produce. you say raining inside of like a, a hailstorm, it's as if they have to materialize under the ceiling or something. Sometimes they're observed materializing under the ceiling, and other objects are observed materializing mm -hmm. under the ceiling. Um, what's interesting about some other cases is that um, large objects the size of pumpkins have been thrown, and it's clear that no, if it's a large rock, that no one person could have just lifted that rock without being observed doing so. Mm -hmm. uh, it would require a catapult or something like that. So, parapsychologists have endeavored to study these cases both in terms of the physics involved, the, the energy required to move these objects around as well as the psychodynamics. It's a very tempting uh, strategy to pursue. I'm not equipped to say how successful it has been or will be. Yeah. Well, I guess it's fair to say that even after centuries of observations, and I'm under the impression there may well be over a thousand cases that uh, researchers uh, have described in, in the literature uh, at this point, we still have very limited understanding. So. Yes, um, one reason is we can't predict when they're going to occur. Um, if poltergeist agents are really producing this themselves, um, we can't conclude that every teenager or adolescent or even uh, a married person in a very difficult marriage mm -hmm. uh, is going to produce these kinds of phenomena. It may just be one way of expressing emotional or psychological distress yeah. available to those people who are more psychokinetically endowed or inclined. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most interesting cases uh, that comes out of England is the case of Matthew Manning, who was uh, a, a teenager at the time, and he was the center of poltergeist activity, but eventually he seemed to develop the ability to control his uh, psychokinesis and seemed to develop other sorts of uh, psychic abilities and ended up uh, having uh, quite, I think, a successful career as a psychic after that. Uh, yes, and in that respect, the Matthew Manning case is, again, different from the norm or mm -hmm. the average. So if these were in fact his abilities, as the case seems to suggest, uh, he was, was able to find a way to channel them more productively. Yeah, It doesn't always work out that way. I think it almost never works yeah. out that way. I uh, know of another case, a uh, popular case in the United States, where the uh, focal point of the poltergeist activity had a bad life, ended up, I think, being uh, jailed and accused of murder. and. Uh, I think it's a controversial case. Um, I don't know that one. Oh, Tina top. Resch. Is, oh, is, Tina Resch, yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, that's a complicated case as well. Yeah, but uh, the point being that the, 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 these poor people who have stones flying about and, and as you say, excrement sometimes flying around, they, it's like they're being persecuted by yeah, some invisible force. Sometimes the phenomena just seem to be mischievous and annoying, but mm -hmm. in any case, it certainly is annoying. Yeah. Um, again, the two best Australian cases fall somewhere in between that. Mm -hmm. uh, one is called Humpty Doo, and the other, as I mentioned, is called Mayanup. Um, in the Humpty Doo case, um, objects would, I think it was in the Humpty Doo case, objects would change trajectories sometimes in mid-flight. It would go this way and then suddenly make a curve. Yeah. Um, objects would, um, hit the ground at a great speed, but um, make a sound as if o only a soft object had been hitting the ground, mm -hmm. even though the object was anything but soft. Or sometimes um, objects would hit the ground very slowly, but make a very loud noise, mm -hmm. contrary to what you'd expect. Or sometimes objects would hit the ground with great force, but not go anywhere, as if they had no momentum. They just stopped dead in their tracks. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned the voices in the Enfield uh, poltergeist case, and uh, there were also rapping yes. sounds. Uh, in other words, attempts in different ways to communicate with the supposed entities. And, and one of the intriguing features is that these sounds and voices were recorded, and the uh, audio signals produced uh, didn't resemble uh, those that would have been produced by normal human vocal cords. My impression was that they resembled a former resident of the house. 
Well, that no, I I, I don't know about that. But well, I, I could be having a yeah. senior moment. <laughs> <laughs> my my recollection is that they were non-human, entirely non-human, and the same thing is true with with you know when you wrap on on wood, for example, like I've just done, it creates a very recognizable uh, audio. Yes. Signal uh, and wrappings that have been produced by uh, spirits and poltergeists, and, and in the Enfield case, uh, produce a different uh, acoustical signal. Yes, Barry Colvin did a very interesting study of uh, wraps produced parano apparently paranormally mm -hmm. and found they do have a different acoustical uh, signature than uh, normally produced wraps. So uh, we have some evidence that something. Um, different than normal human activity is going on. Um, certainly different than normal human activity, yeah. but it may still be human activity. It, r right. I, in, in other words, human psychic activity. Yes. I guess the point is that it wouldn't be fraudulent to, if, if a normal rap uh, is, produces a different kind no, of no, uh, not at all. acoustic signal. And it reinforces the point I made earlier that there are lots of borderline cases. So yeah. um, it's not just that there is there are sometimes fuzzy boundaries between poltergeist and haunting cases, mm -hmm. um, but the Enfield in some ways has uh, similarities with, with both. Mm -hmm. I know when I did uh, this study with Ted Owens, the PK man, who consciously produced a wide variety of uh, macro PK phenomenon, he also complained that uh, he was being uh, hounded by various forms of poltergeist activity. Um, I've heard that before in other cases as well. For mm -hmm. example, the uh, Gold Leaf Lady case, which I studied, that began as a poltergeist case mm -hmm. uh, before the woman Katie started to break out in this golden colored foil. She was experiencing uh, very classic poltergeist phenomena, objects appearing and disappearing, furniture rearranging itself. Mm -hmm. um, so, and in fact, a subject I've been studying in Argentina, who appears to be able to make tables rise by touching them very lightly. Um, he's been a poltergeist agent for, for many, many years. And even today, when he gets agitated, things fly off shelves. Mm -hmm. Well. It may well be far more common uh, than we appreciate uh, the occasional episode. Well, the reason it may be more common, we, we may not recognize it when it happens, because mm -hmm. what we're going to recognize are only the most histrionic or unusual events. And persistent. Persistent, yes. By so, the time uh, researchers get there, there's already quite a history, and then that needs to persist in order for researchers to have anything at all to describe. Right. And here I'm being only partially frivolous, but if, it, if these phenomena can happen in uh, more surreptitious ways, then we might wonder why our socks are disappearing. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in fact, uh, many people experience, you know, objects mysteriously disappearing yes. and, and reappearing, which yes. uh, is uh, characteristic of poltergeist cases. It is characteristic, and if people wonder whether they're dealing with paranormal apports or just human forgetfulness, check and see if the objects are too warm to touch, or at mm -hmm. least unusually warm. That would be a sign. One thing that does emerge from these cases is that the larger the objects apported are, the more hot they seem to get. Right. So there seems to be some correlation between the size of the apported objects and the degree of heat uh, mm -hmm. they give off. Mm -hmm. Well, it strikes me that um, just as Freud wrote this fascinating book, The Psychopathology of Everyday Life, that um, somebody you know, so at some point, well, a few people probably have written about the parapsychology of everyday life. and. Uh, poltergeist activity would fit right into that kind of a scenario. Absolutely. So it's a, a fertile ground of research for those who are interested also in depth psychology. Mm -hmm. So ideally, you'd want one or at least a team of investigators who are good at uh, uh, setting up conditions of observation and also good at probing the inner lives of the people involved mm -hmm. in the phenomena. I know that uh, our deceased colleague, Dr. Robert Morris, did a study uh, many years ago, uh, sort of related, about people who, uh, they get near a computer and the computer stops working. 
Yes, that could easily be uh, a manifestation of unconscious uh, uh, PK. Mm -hmm. I know from my studies of multiple personality that um, when clinicians have been dealing with subjects who seem to have some psychic abilities or when they're in therapy sessions with them, often their recording apparatus will fail to work. Mm -hmm. Now, typically people who are experiencing poltergeist phenomenon want somebody to uh, come in and make it stop. If only it were that easy. Yeah. Um, sure, they want it to stop. I mean, unless they're publicity hounds, which is almost never the case, the phenomena can be destructive. They could be losing a lot of uh, uh, dishes and uh, um, objects in the house if CD players are flinging themselves mm -hmm. around and so on. And um, I gather uh, sometimes uh, bringing in psychics and mediums uh, can help uh, mitigate the phenomenon. <laughs> well, sometimes if you want to make phenomena go away, just bring in a parapsychologist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the phenomenon can be shy. Yes. And if there are a lot of observers, it, it, it might just stop. Well, I know in the Enfield poltergeist case that went on for a couple of years in England, and our uh, friend Guy Lyon Playfair was one right. of the researchers there. The, the family was frightened, and, yes. and he didn't know what to do. Uh, the, it kept persisting. He thought it would go away in a few months because he wrote the average case lasts about two months. Right. But this case went on for years. And he said he made a point of telling the family that don't worry, it's troublesome, it's a nuisance, but no real harm ever comes out of these cases. And he writes in his book that he knew he lied to them, that at least on rare occasions, this phenomenon can be harmful. Well, the Eleanor Zugun case shows that, among others. There mm -hmm. have been other cases where objects have been flinging themselves perilously at um, the people who've been investigating or the agents themselves. I know there's a case uh, in Brazil where uh, some young woman uh, had, had been punctured, penetrated by needles. Her body was full of needles, and they showed up on x-rays. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it was very frightening, and in and, and, and that context, it's easy for to understand how people would assume this is something diabolic. Or that the person's filled with self-hatred. So, mm -hmm. I mean, let's not forget the uh, depth psychological yeah. uh, approach to these things. You have to ask yourself, you know, what's really going on in the mental life of these people? Well, um, your former friend and colleague, Dr. Jewel Eisenbud, uh, wrote about that extensively. In Yes, he didn't deal so much with um, poltergeist cases, but he certainly dealt with other respects in which the manifestation of uh, the phenomena reflected the underlying psychodynamics of, uh, say, a marital situation or a living situation mm -hmm. of some other sort. He felt that if a person had a self-destructive impulse and also had psychic gifts, the, the, those gifts might come into the service of that self-destructive impulse. Well, there's no doubt that we use our ordinary gifts for self-destructive purposes, mm -hmm. um, or we do things to ourselves despite knowledge that we shouldn't do those things. Yeah. So if it can happen in ordinary ways, why can't it also happen in paranormal? Well, it's, it's one of the reasons that I myself am very hesitant to encourage anybody to try to develop or cultivate psychokinetic abilities. Um, yes, it's hard to know what to make of that because mm -hmm. does that mean that we're just suppressing the um, learning of overt manifestations of PK abilities, or is this something that we're perhaps doing uh, under the surface all the time? Again, yeah, yeah. the only events that we're going to know about are those that attract our attention. Mm -hmm. You know, we could be causing car crashes or heart attacks, and it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to distinguish them from the same events caused normally. Well, in, indeed, and that, that raises a specter that uh, these things are going on all the time. And, uh, and indeed they may be. That's mm -hmm. why I've often suggested that yeah. a fertile ground of research for parapsychologists would be to study people who are uncommonly lucky or unlucky. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's one way in which um, our own psychic resources might be marshaled to uh, affect our lives in some consistent ways. Mm -hmm. Based on the you know, psychodynamics of the individual. Yes, I'm particularly interested in the cases of people who are remarkably unlucky. Um, 
there's an old Yiddish distinction between a shlemiel and a shlemazel. A shlemiel is someone who spills soup on himself, and a shlemazel has it spilt on him. Yeah. So the idea is that a shlemazel is a victim of impersonal forces or, or the universe at large, someone the universe is just crapping on in one way or mm -hmm. another. And shlemazels really exist. Mm -hmm. I may have even mentioned it in one of our previous interviews, but... Um, it's worth mentioning again. It's it's a lovely uh, story. Yeah. I've I lived next door to a pair of Schlemazels once, and it seems as, as if almost everything they bought was defective. Their cars were always in the shop, even though uh, they had brands noted for their reliability. Mm -hmm. uh, electronic equipment would fail to work right out of the box. Uh, their infant son was placed on a brand new rocking chair they got, and within two days, uh, that chair had broken with the infant son mm -hmm. on it. And my favorite example of their schlamazelness was when uh, the wife bought a poster-sized photograph of what she thought was the Golden Gate Bridge, had it framed and put on her wall, and I had to tell her that what she had actually framed was the Brooklyn Bridge. So here's a woman who both literally and figuratively bought the Brooklyn Bridge, <laughs> which at least your older viewers will know is a, a traditional image of the sucker yeah. or the loser. It doesn't look anything like the Golden Gate no, Bridge. No, no. <laughs> so, I mean, I think a really sensitive examination of people who seem to be unusually lucky or unlucky mm -hmm. would might would possibly give us some idea about the natural history of PK or psychic mm -hmm. functioning. Well, I, and I hope that happens. Based on past history, it's likely to be a very slow process. I'm not holding my breath. Yeah. Stephen Browdy, thank you so much for sharing this half hour with me. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.